you had control of time, what would you do with it? What would be most important with those powers? In a factory outside of time itself, or run by cats, it's a reality. Especially for Blinks. Today, I thought I'd do one of those retrospective look into Blinks, seeing as though Phil Spencer at least mentioned its name in the Katagri interview, and how both Blinks games came out on the original Xbox, and one of them made it to the Platinum Hits, which you can get on the Xbox One. But not many people would probably know about it. Blinks the Time Sweeper is a third-person platformer game, which was stated to be the world's first 4D action game. Blinks the Time Sweeper was released in 2002, developed by Artoon and published by Microsoft. Microsoft wanted to make titles that would appeal to foreign markets, so they set up a branch of Microsoft Game Studios in Japan. Artoon was led by Naoto Oshima, an artist and video game developer known for designing Sonic, suggested on making them a mascot, like how Mario would be for Nintendo and Sonic for Sega. Halo was the unofficial mascot at the time, and Blinks definitely didn't change that, despite the officials wanting a friendly, furry face, which the chief was too violent and was hiding behind a visor concealing his identity. But due to Blinks' unpopularity, they never went with it. Naoto Oshima was inspired by the fairy tale character known as Puss in Boots, an anthropomorphic cat who uses trickery and deceit. They really liked the idea of a cat with time control powers, so they stuck with it. The original drawing of Blinks had purple fur, but that was changed to what he is known for now, which is orange. While this probably wasn't a part of the design decisions, the orange symbolizes his energy and enthusiasm, while the blue top shows his confidence, and the red pants shows his strength and his passion. Blinks is also the only one with a bell. The opposing group in the game are a space pirate gang known as the Tom Tom Gang, they're a group of anthropomorphic pigs who are known as space pirates with the ability to control space. Their group colors center towards green, yellow, and red. Green to show their jealousy and envy, but also their misfortune when facing the time factory. Yellow for their greed and deceit, while red shows the aggression and violence. They even have their own theme song every time you fight them, which is playing in the background. Oh, we're talking about music. Each world has their own music playing. Some of the songs seem fitting to the theme of the levels, like our glass cave is. Well, in a cave where the water reflects the light onto the walls and probably one of the more colorful maps. The music having arpeggios played by the harp, marimbas, and some synths, while having some sounds with water themes like water drops or sonar pings. These are commonly played in water levels to symbolize the movement of the water. Other songs don't really sound like they fit, but they have something that can tie in with the song. Like Mine of Precious Moments is on a mountainous canyon type place, which is connected by minecarts, where you can easily fall to your death. It does give some sounds a delay of sorts, but it feels more of a water level than anything. As a whole, it uses very similar instrumentation and sounds tonally consistent. That's not to say they all sound the same, they sound like they would all come from the same game. Well, some soundtracks are really fitting, some feel a little off. All boss fights, barring the last, have the same song playing. Every time you do a significant amount of damage to the boss, the song changes key, and there's a sine wave frequency getting crazy along with it, essentially building up until you beat the boss. And once you beat the boss, you can hear things start quieting down, you can also hear more of like a clock ticking theme. More to suggest that things are going back to normal. The same concept can be heard on the last boss. The boss fight music are the only dynamic songs in the game. All the world music, they play their own theme music and just loop it until you finish the stage. They'll add some sound effects like when the gates are open to move on to the next stage or you're running out of time and you need to step it up, but they will play on top of the world's theme song and not change it. When every world has three stages and all the stages look similar, 
but sound the same, and when they aren't reactive to what you do in the game and just loop over and over, the stages in a world kind of just blend together. With the sound design, you're able to figure out if a few enemy types have you in their sights. The ones that specifically rush you and are somewhat speedy, they have a sharp wind sound followed by either a louder and faster bouncing, or a special sound for spikers that spin towards you. The dust herders and octobloons have a charging up sound when they plan to shoot and so on. In terms of their unaware state, their sounds are based on their movement instead of having individual sounds. Floating enemies have the same floating sound, and bouncing enemies have the same bouncing sound. Blinks has its own sounds as well, having more actions and having sounds that are different from each other. A jump and a double jump has different sounds. You'll know when you are locked onto an enemy with two small beeps. It even has a cheer for a kill shot, even if you miss. While we're on Blinks, he is fully animated. Well, mostly. At least in a sense where the transitions between each actions are animated, and it makes it all flow together. If you were to do a 180, Blinks will actually turn around instead of instantly flip. He even has different idle animations on the more harsher worlds like Everwinter and Forge of Hours. There are a lot of small details like these, even down to which sweeper you have. A level 2 sweeper will suck up level 2 trash, but it's struggling to do so to suggest it's using its full power. While it's all well and good for realism and immersion, it does add a delay to the action. While the delay isn't long at all, it's something to work around. The goal of every stage is to wipe out all the time monsters before the world explodes. Literally, you have 10 minutes to complete each level. Doing so while using time controls for traversal, combat, and solving puzzles. For those who are coming from shooters, the camera controls are not what you expect. They are more on the level of older platforming. But since this is a platformer, it's fitting. What I mean by this is that everything is inverted. Left is right, right is left. Up is down and down is up. The camera can be a little bit of a problem when you get into enclosed spaces or when you're up right against the wall. In terms of movement, in my opinion, the walking speed feels a little slow, but I guess they have to make use of the fast forward time ability somehow. Jumping has the potential of getting you killed pretty easily. Jumping up and forward isn't too bad. When you get jumped by an enemy, you want to jump slightly to the side or jump back. There is a slight chance you can do a side flip or a back flip. And this is bad. This is because with a regular jump or a double jump, you have full control of your jump. Side flips and back flips have a set animation with set distances. And the worst part about it is that trying to do them is not consistent at all. You may not even be trying to do it either, but you end up doing so, which could land on an enemy or into a pit of lava. The way you deal with enemies, as you suck up trash around you with your sweeper and shoot it at the enemies. The way you aim your sweeper, however, is generally based on the direction Blinks is directly facing with a little leniency when there's a targetable object, whether it be enemy or a shooting button. This can cause a lot of issues, as it'll just target something else. If you're on the same level as an enemy, or one of these buttons, even if they're slightly above height, your trash shots can sometimes get caught and not reach your target, so you're better off jumping and shooting. I should point out that everything one hit kills you. In terms of time controls, you have five different ones that you can control. Six if you include retry. The way to obtain them is to collect four crystals. Depending on your combo, you'll get a corresponding time control. Collecting three of a kind will grant you one while collecting four will grant you two. Collecting a combo will sort of lock you into an animation to where the only way to cancel the animation is to jump out of it. Rewind lets you rewind the time of the world and the enemies, though it doesn't change the time it takes until the world explodes. Fast forward makes you go fast, like Sonic, while giving you a shield. I should know that you're only able to take one hit for the shield. And having my previous comment with getting one-shotted by everything, it gives you essentially a second life. Pause makes the world freeze in time while you don't. It's good as your get out of jail free card with fighting monsters and good for things that are too fast for you to progress. Record is definitely the most useful in terms of combat. You play however you want while being invincible, only to rewind back in time so you can play along with that invulnerable recording and enemies will react to that recording. There are very rare cases where you would rather use slow over pause, and those normally occur later in the game. Actually, just, just one. 
just one place. Otherwise, you're better off with the pause. Those related to slow are generally non-issues. In terms of the puzzles, they're mostly tied to a time control, and they're all pretty basic when it comes down to it. Not only that, but there aren't that many different puzzles to deal with in terms of those tied to time control. When something's broken or you want to traverse to a higher ground, rewind is normally your best bet. In some cases, if you go pretty far, while still in rewind, it's essentially a pseudo pause, which is pretty useful. Fast forward only has one type of puzzle linked to it. If things are moving too fast, then pause. If you know the map, you can easily pause to go through puzzles that had other time controls in mind, making it the most useful. If you require more than one person, then record, which is generally only used for pushing buttons and seesaws. There are 11 time monsters in the game, each one having their own variations of each. They mostly act the same, but later variations take longer to kill. Why you can break down enemies into groups in terms of how they work, which are your front lines, range, tanks, and support. The different monsters in those groups act differently. As an example, Chronobobs just bounce towards you while Spikers spin towards you, and it's invulnerable while it does so, so you do have to play around with each one. Which I guess leads us to the worlds in the game. There are 9 worlds in this game, each having 3 stages plus a boss fight at the end. The ninth world is just boss fights though. Each world has its own unique properties to them, and they all feel and sound different from each other. Deja Vu Canals and Hourglass Cave add water to the mix. There aren't any inherent dangers when playing in Deja Vu Canals, they do add some spike traps into Hourglass Cave, but that just shows that every time they introduce something, they make them easier to deal with at the start, but make it harder as you go on. The way you progress your character in the game is through the shop in-game. This was a time where there weren't microtransactions, so you can feel safe with that. I will point out, however, if you purchase a sweeper or a set of clothing and you want to change to a different one, you have to pay gold on top of getting rid of your current equipment. So if you wanted to switch back, you're going to have to buy them again. How easy is it to get gold? Depending on the level, 300 to 1500, and 2000 is a good run, and that's generally where there are a lot of gold presents and you have to fight a Tom Tom gang for them. And on top of that, the trash remaining in your sweeper counts towards that gold. This is pretty relevant, seeing as though the best sweeper in the game is 90,000 gold, though that is behind 80 collectibles as well. The later levels don't guarantee higher gold, so if you have the time and patience and actually like the gameplay, you're going to have a lot of grinding to get to the best sweeper in the game, which is locked behind collectibles mind you. On top of that, if you want to increase your retries, which you start at 3 and max out at 9, which is fitting for a cat, each one costing 1000 each, as well as max out the time holders, which boosts the amount of time controls you can hold, in total 3 to begin with, and 10 being max, costing 300 each. On top of that, you have to buy 2 special sweepers, so you can get the last few collectibles. They cost 3000 each, and on top of that, you need a level 3 sweeper as well, which costs at least 4000. On top of that, a sweeper pack large, which is 1500, so the total ends up being 109,600 gold in total to max out. And that's a lot of grinding considering the amounts you get. The sweepers you can buy determine what you can pick up. The regular items lying around in levels, any sweeper can pick up. Bigger ones found in later levels are level 2 and above, while the 16 ton weight as well as the giant rock and hourglass cave are reserved for level 3 sweepers. I should point out that regular trash deals 1 point of damage, Bigger Trash deals 2 and level 3 deals 3 points of damage. Apart from levels, most sweepers are just aesthetic, but there's two sweepers that do different things. The TS-2000 Freeze and the TS-2000 Flame Sweepers. Technically there's three, but the TSX-7 Supreme does everything every sweeper can do, including what Flame and Freeze can do, and it's what you get the ability to purchase after collecting 80 cat medals. Freeze gives you the ability to suck water, as well as turning the trash you shoot out a blue glow, simulating frost, which really only affects one type of enemy. The same goes with the flame sweeper except it sucks up flames and gives the item shooting a red glow, simulating flame, and working on a different type of enemy. Enemy in question are the illusion lizards. The big fire lizard illusion 
and the big blob illusions get one-shotted in their illusion form by the freeze and flame respectively. Other than them, it has no effect on other monsters. I would have liked to see that do some more things. They are both level 2 sweepers, so the very big items like the 16 ton weight, you're not going to be able to suck them up. In terms of puzzles that use these, the free sweeper is needed for a few puzzles to collect a few cat medals, while the flame sweeper is required for one puzzle to get one cat medal. When you can count how many collectibles you need these sweepers for in one hand, then I feel like these sweepers are underutilized in that department, especially when they are not required to obtain if you want to complete the game. They are only for collectibles really, or if you want to pick up better trash. As for the other things you can buy in the shop, Bombs and spike bullets are either used or they give you gold at the end of the mission if you still have them in your sweeper, albeit at a lower price than when you bought them, as well as cosmetics. When buying these cosmetics, it only shows the top, not the pants or the shoes, so you don't really know if they will work well together. There are 80 cat medallions in the game to collect. Each stage that isn't a boss stage has at least 3 to 5 cat medals in them, each of them either requiring a time puzzle or are hidden from sight, or even having a different sweeper. And the fact that you have to collect all 80 cat medals and pay 90,000 gold on top of that to get the sweeper is beyond me. You do get 12 other prizes for milestones on the amount of cat medals you earn. Most of these are just small animations and others are concept art which are neat additions. After you complete each mission, it will give you a breakdown of what you collected and the time you beat the stage. It also shows you a replay of what you just played, but in a more cinematic view. Instead of a third person over the shoulder perspective, since there is a time limit in the game, there is also a system to where it will rate you how fast you complete the stages. Going from S+, which is the fastest you can get, to game over, which is when you fail. And to my knowledge, you don't really get anything from getting everything over S+, so there really isn't an incentive to pursue that goal. It does, however, give it an arcade feel to where you would want to get a higher score if you were to optimize here and there, as well as go back and collect the cat medals when you were able to. Things to keep in mind, you can boop your record itself, and retries can mess you up in an eternal loop. There really isn't much to the story outside of the prologue and the ending cutscenes. So much so that, that there are essentially only four cutscenes that add to the story in total. The prologue, the very last stage, having two of them, and the ending. And that's saying if you count the second last cutscene and the ending as separate cutscenes, as going into your collections and looking at the ending cutscene doesn't show you what happens before that part. The other cutscenes that aren't those four are just introductions to the time boss monsters. Most of the story is told via a monologue to show the players this world and how it functions and their distribution of time. The other way they tell us a story is through the news broadcast, which is showing us what is happening in this story. But in terms of the story itself, it's a simple, basic story, but nuanced and pretty creative, with the setting and its time control powers that the cats in Time Factory possess and the Tom Tom Gang's ability to manipulate space. Touted as the first 4D platformer, and has a pretty unique concept in that you're a time controlling cat who creates time in the form of time crystals, up against space pigs who stole your time crystals and a princess, and as a result, turning them into time monsters. Story wise, there isn't really much to go off of, and while the time control puzzles are interesting, they're pretty basic, and there aren't very many varieties. The controls and the camera can be a bit finicky. The graphics for its time was pretty good. As a whole, it wouldn't be fair to compare it with today's games, though it was going up against games from 2012 like Kingdom Hearts and Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus. Those games definitely have way more to offer, especially if you're not the grinding type as this being a short experience without it. They did come out with a sequel to this game called Blinks 2 Masters of Time and Space, though I won't be able to play through it as I don't have an original Xbox 360 more or the game itself. I have played it though, back in the day at least. This is actually the first time doing one of these. I might do one for all the games I play, but if you watch this, let me know if this is something that might interest you, as well as anything I could do better. But anyways, that'll be all for now, so thanks for watching you legends, I appreciate you.
and have a good morning, afternoon, evening, night, whatever time is for you, and until I pass cross.